So um, the topic here is on chronic stress and uh, how it impacts your health. Um, as a radiation oncologist, this is my main job, and I use very high-tech uh, toys like this. This is a linear accelerator. And uh, with, with toys like this, I'm able to uh, treat tumors deep inside the body uh, without actually opening up the body. And so uh, I can you know, cure tumors in the brain and lung and a variety of other places, and if not cure, at least hopefully shrink these tumors down so that the patients will have a better outcome. I use robots uh, to do the same thing, putting radioactive pellets uh, in various different places to kill cancer on the body. And then uh, I'm just playing around here in a, in a device called the Gamma Knife, which is not really a funny device at all, uh, where I can treat uh, tumors in the brain uh, in one single session without opening up the head. The patient feels nothing. Um, and then I use low-tech stuff. Um, as you heard, I'm also an acupuncturist. And I combine uh, acupuncture with the, the care of many patients for a variety of different reasons. Uh, whether that be for stress reduction or anxiety, uh, nausea, pain, uh, a variety of different other symptoms that patients can have as they're going through cancer treatment and into survivorship. Um, I'm also uh, very knowledgeable about supplements and nutrition and a variety of different lifestyle modifications that um, can change your biological terrain so that hopefully not only could you get through cancer treatments more easily, uh, which improves outcomes, hopefully, but also hopefully reducing your risk of cancer recurrence or cancer progression. So I sit down with patients and go through you know, shopping bags full of supplements and, and whatnot. Just This is all part of something that is called, it's a movement called integrative oncology, and that's IO. Integrative oncology is where we combine the high-tech cancer treatments that all of us know, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, et cetera, along with the complementary therapies. Okay massage, acupuncture, et cetera, and lifestyle changes. All of these are combined in a, in a, a way that is customized for the individual patient. And uh, again, the hope and goal is to hopefully have better cancer outcomes and hopefully uh, patients have less side effects. And it's also very empowering for patients to know that these are things that you can actually do. For example, lifestyle modification uh, things and a variety of complementary therapies that you can do like meditation. So what happened that kind of inspired all this? Well, um, I want, I was the, I'm a firstborn child, and I you know, wanted to impress everybody. And so e even when I was at, at Harvard in the Navy, this sort of came along with me. And my bosses and my, prof my bow tie wearing professors, um, I, I thought that what I would do is try to prove that they are right by the fact that most of these complementary therapies were indeed snake oil. Okay, They were placebo. And most of my patients were coming into the office. Uh, you know, telling all of us in front of the professors uh, that a lot of these things uh, that, they're, that they're doing are really helping them. And my professors would give them, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then we'd walk out of there and they'd be like, bullshit. Yeah. And uh, so, in any case, um, I thought, you know, I need to design some studies to look at this. And so um, I created a study with hundreds of mice, and I implanted a tumor into the mice of breast cancer, into these mice, and then I fed them diets of either green tea enhanced diet or uh, uh, vitamin E enhanced diet. And what I did, then did was then grew these tumors in the mice and then radiated them. And the uh, mice had an outcome that was actually pretty amazing. It turned out that we were telling our patients that if you gave antioxidants during chemotherapy and radiation, you made the treatment less effective. And uh, what it turned out was actually it didn't do anything to the efficacy of the treatment at all. But what it did do, which was encouraging and good, but what it did do was it significantly reduced the side effects, the damage from the radiation to the normal tissue. So that was very fascinating and had not been reported before. Um, it also slowed the growth of tumor cells down, or tumors down. So that was very, also very interesting. Um, and then when I moved on from that, um, I started to wonder about acupuncture. And so I thought, you know what? I wonder if that's a placebo. And I really didn't care one way or another if it was placebo. And so I thought, you know what, placebo effect in, in acupuncture and placebo effect in many complementary therapies and also in conventional therapies, difficult to prove whether something is effective or not because of the placebo effect, which we can go on for a long time and, and not possible to do here in terms of time. 
But what I needed to do was create some sort of placebo for acupuncture needles. So I thought about these disappearing needles, you know, the dagger that they use on stage. And uh, I created a needle in my shop in my garage where the needle actually retracted back up into the handle. And then I had a little base that you would put over the acupuncture points. And, um, and by the way, I was an acupuncturist, so I'm, I'm legit, you know. <laughs> And uh, so uh, basically I did studies looking to see whether real needles, which actually poke through the skin, or these things would have an effect. And it turns out the patients had no idea whether they were getting poked with a real needle or not. No idea. So that was beautiful. So it validated at least the tool. And then whether or not the efficacy was there, uh, we did a bunch of different studies and we published a variety of different things. So that kind of got me into this whole world of integrative oncology. I started going to conferences. I got on the board of the Society for Integrative Oncology. Uh, Pacific College of Oriental Medicine put me on their board. I, I did a bunch of uh, projects with their graduate students. Got published in a variety of different things. Uh, Dr. Andrew Weil and Donald Abrams, who's the uh, director of integrative oncology at UC San Francisco. All of you know Andrew Weil, probably. Um, they asked me to write a chapter on how to use complementary therapies in cancer care to help minimize side effects of cancer treatment. And then my company, 21st Century Oncology, that I work for, which is the largest cancer provider in, in the world, actually, um, they asked me to be their director of integrative oncology, so that's what I do. And then uh, all along, I started creating uh, other content because I'm repeating myself over and over and over again. And so I created a website where I would be able to put all of this information, integrativeoncology-essentials.com which is the number one website in the world for integrative oncology. And integrative oncology is not just a phenomenon that's local, it's everywhere in the world. When people are searching this, this was just one day that, uh, earlier this week. I created a program called anti cancerize Me, which is a program to, is a structured program to basically get patients to understand and learn this material in a way that uh, doesn't overwhelm them. Uh, there are a variety of different topics that I go through from diet, uh, exercise, stress reduction, a variety of different labs looking at physiologic factors in our body that may promote cancer, uh, and then reducing toxic exposures. I have teaching modules that patients can do online so they can go back and learn this on their own. And then I have risk assessment tools so they can figure out how anti-cancer they are by modulating or changing uh, various different risk factors. So a lot of cool stuff and uh, I implement that in the practice and uh, it's also people can do it all over the world through the website. So when I'm practicing uh, medicine, just in general, I'm sort of thinking about everything in this holistic manner. And I start thinking about most patients will come to the office with a symptom. And that is the typical way that most Western physicians are trained is to treat the symptom, not necessarily to go back to figure out what the root cause is. Okay, And so that's something that is part of a, another whole field of medicine called functional medicine which is something that I have gotten into and incorporated into my practice of integrative oncology. So looking back at the root causes, they could be emotional, dietary, pathogens, toxins, you name it, etc. These are the things that then cause problems to our body, the body systems, whether they be our hormonal system, our gut, um, detoxification systems like our, in our liver, etc. And ultimately these things will impact finally on symptoms that patients are presenting with. And that's, of course, that's where every, all, all the physicians pretty much focus most of their effort. But we have to go back and look at what is causing these things. And so, for example, we're here talking about stress. So let's go back. I have a patient who maybe presents to not my office because I'm an oncologist, but let's just say uh, if I was a primary care physician, for example, and the patient presents to me with weight gain, fatigue, and depression. Uh, it would be incumbent upon them to start figuring, okay, so where did this all come from? Not just, you know, let's put you on an exercise regimen, for example, because you're, you're fat and uh, whatever else. Put you on Prozac and you know, put an, throw another pill at you. So we have to go back and look to see what was the etiology, how did this all develop, and what systems may have broken down. And there are many symptoms when we're dealing with stress. There, it's a systemic-wide thing. Anywhere on your body, pretty much chronic stress can impact every organ system in your body. And obviously you can't read that from here, but the point being is those little bullet points show you pretty much everywhere it impacts. And there was a field that started probably at least 30 years ago, if not 40 years ago, called psychoneuroimmunology, PNI. And PNI sort of started this un understanding scientifically um, 
to really kind of figure out what was the pathophysiology and the physiology of how our brain impacts the rest of our body. And there is a ton of research out there that now, of course, is, is melding into a lot of the mindfulness research and, and frankly, immunology itself. Uh, you name it, all of those organ systems here are impacted by the brain. So let's kind of go through the process just a little bit so you kind of understand the complexity of it. We will not go diving into the specific um, hormones, but just to say that when you feel some sort of stress, and there are many different types of stressors that, that can come in, either internal stressors or external stressors, um, when they are chronically pre uh, present, um, then your brain starts to secrete some hormones, particularly adrenaline and cortisol, and those things will then be uh, squirted out uh, by your adrenal glands. And the, there's a complex process that happens, and that's the point of this slide. It's very complex, lots of hormones, all starting, all because your brain sensed some stress. And these impact, these hormones impact the, the whole system, everything from your immune system to you name it. Um, people oftentimes present with thyroid problems, for example, to the primary care doctor. Well, guess what? That also can be linked all the way back to stress, interestingly. And people also come in with all sorts of sexual dysfunctional symptoms. And your sex hormones are also directly related to what's going on with your stress hormones. The main sources of stressors, what we're going to be talking, of course, we have been talking about today is emotional stress pr predominantly, psychological stress. But other things can also impact stress and also impact uh, the release of these hormones. For example, dietary sources of stress. When you let your blood sugar level go too low, for example, or your blood sugars go too high. Um, and then there are hidden sources of stress, like hidden sources of inflammation. For example, in your gut, um, there is pain and a variety of other things things that can also lead to stress, but these are the top three, and emotional being by far the number one. So as an oncologist, I'm sitting down with my patients and trying to explain to them why it's so important that they identify that they have stress and what to do about it. Because this is true, and although most oncologists that are conventionally trained uh, don't necessarily believe in this, um, this impacts your body, okay, and it definitely changes your physiology. And what happens is chronic stress, through the release of, of stress hormones, turns on a very important switch in your, on your cells and then that impacts your DNA. And it's called nuclear factor kappa B. When that switch is on, you get chronic inflammation across your body. And chronic inflammation basically is uh, something that happens after really days to weeks pass, cortisol is continuing to go in the acute phase, and then months go on, and then chronic stress is that from, from basically months to years, okay? We have to have inflammation in our body. We have to have it. That NF-kappa B has to be on in order to basically keep us alive so we can fight off infections and heal wounds. But then that switch should go off when those things are managed. It's when, those, when that switch does not go off, that's the problem. And it's that problem that is the source of pretty much the fuel for all of the major chronic diseases that we deal with. And if we could figure a way to deal with inflammation, going back, looking at the root causes again, stress being very important, we would have impacts across almost every single major chronic disease, including cancer. So this is what happens to our body when, we are we, when we're dealing with chronic inflammation. That little flame guy at the top, okay, is the symbol for chronic inflammation. And when our cells are in the presence of chronic inflammation, over years, okay, it takes years, those, that cell becomes sick, okay, it basically develops DNA mutations. And those are either precancerous or potentially not, because if you turn off inflammation, they can go back and become healthy again. The body can repair DNA damage. But if you keep pushing on that cell with more inflammation for years, this is, this is what will happen. These are the main culprits for chronic inflammation. And today, of course, we're dealing with chronic stress. But environmental chemicals, the chemicals we put in our body, not getting enough exercise, our diet is actually really important, and it also impacts stress, interestingly. Obesity, not basically just being overweight, uh, not getting enough sleep, and then chronic infections. All of these things can impact inflammation. And all of those things can stress out uh, the adrenal glands and cause them to squirt out that adrenaline and cortisol. 
And so when, those when adrenaline and cortisol are being squirted out chronically, you have all sorts of physiologic things happen that you do not want to have happen, which in, in particular can lead to, if you're a cancer patient, um, cancer development, cancer growth, cancer recurrence, for example. Uh, one of the important ones is insulin and blood sugar problems. So if you're stressed, you develop a sim uh, something called insulin resistance, which we'll get to in a little bit, and your blood sugar levels remain relatively high, and your body starts squirting out more insulin. Not a good situation to be in uh, f for a variety of reasons, which I'll get to. Uh, these Also, these hormones increase the production of very, very reactive chemicals. These are called free radicals, which interact with your DNA and cause trouble. Uh, they directly can uh, flick on that switch uh, for NF-kappa Bs, turning on inflammation. They suppress your immune system, which is, of course, very bad if you want to make sure your body is looking around for cancer cells. Um, they also turn off genes that repair DNA damage, and also genes that kill cancer cells, automatically turn, basically kill them through a process called apoptosis. And then they also uh, cause the release of growth factors in your body that your tissues actually make that actually stimulate the growth of cancer in them, kind of evil. This is just an example to show you uh, that, uh, that these hormones actually are important. So these, these, this is a mouse uh, that, is, that has a tumor implanted into its hind uh, in the upper left corner. And uh, this is a, uh, basically a radiology study, so you can see where the tumor is. And so when you stress out the mouse, just by simply keeping it restrained, we'll stress it out, uh, that tumor will metastasize. Much greater chance of it metastasizing than a mouse that is not stressed out. And so that's what they found with, with doing these experiments. And these are done on many, many, many mice to figure out exactly the averages of what's happening. So that's what's going on here. Then when you give the mouse the stress, but you give them a stress-blocking drug called propranolol, which is a very common blood pressure medication, it turns out that that prevents the metastasis of the cancer. So that stress hormone actually is very much responsible for tumor metastasis. And then when you give a drug called isoproteranol and do another experiment, isoproteranol is a stressor drug. It's basically, it looks very similar to cortisol. And basically you give it to that poor mouse and uh, that, that, that thing is toasted. And so if, if uh, you know, there are people out there, and in, in, in particularly in my field in oncology, that don't believe that uh, stress and cancer have any relationship with each other, I like to point out to them one of the most prestigious journals in, in science called Nature that has done a, uh, uh, there was a meta-analysis uh, looking at studies of chronic stress and relationships to cancer, and they found that, that populations of people who were chronically stressed did have increased risk, 6 to 21 percent higher risk of developing cancer. But most importantly to me are, of course, the patients that are sitting in front of me. If you have cancer, your risk of dying from that cancer is up to 133% higher. This was an amazing study done out of Ohio State University, one of my favorites. And what they did was they took 227 ladies. They were all breast cancer survivors. And they randomized them into two groups. Okay, So they had all been treated for their breast cancer. One group was taught some stress reduction techniques uh, a few hours a month for a year. And the other group was told, we'll see you at your regular follow-up visits. And then they followed these ladies out for years. Okay, now we're out to 11 years. And the previous studies basically all show decreased inflammation. The ladies who had done the stress reduction uh, improved immune function. But what does this really matter clinically? This is what's cool. 11 years later, there was 45% fewer breast cancer recurrences and nearly 60% fewer breast cancer deaths in the ladies that practiced 11 years earlier some stress reduction techniques. So physiologically, this is, this is very important. And um, I try to, I sh uh, this is probably not just breast cancer. This is probably all different types of cancer. And in fact, not just cancer, because we're all here you know, talking about anything physiologic. And it can be heart disease, it can be diabetes, it can be Alzheimer's. This will impact the body. And even if you don't believe that there's a physiologic connection between stress and health. People behave differently, okay? That's for sure. People smoke more, they drink more, they don't eat properly, uh, they don't exercise as much, they don't get enough sleep, etc. And physiologically, people get heart attacks and have other cardiac events at a greater rate. Their wounds don't heal as well when they're chronically stressed. 
And then here's an example of sort of what this insulin resistance is. The guy in the blue shirt, that's insulin resistance and what he's doing. This is an animated slide that doesn't work. But basically, um, it, he's, he's able to take sugar, which is in that box, and basically put it into the cell. That's what insulin does. Insulin takes the sugar that's floating around in your blood and puts it into the cells in your tissue. What happens is the purple dude is insulin resistance, and he's supposed to block that process. So insulin resistance is when your insulin is not working well. Your body doesn't recognize it. So you eat a meal. Your, uh, the, the food goes across your gut wa wall, and blood sugar levels go up. And then what happens is your pancreas starts to squirt out insulin. And that's cool and all great, uh, except when insulin isn't working very well, your blood sugar levels stay high, and then your pancreas says, huh, maybe I need to squirt out more insulin. That is not good, because insulin is a cancer growth factor. We learned about this in 2010, that most cancer cells have insulin receptors on them. And so we do not want to be in a situation where we have excess insulin floating around. The liver squirts out IGF-1, which is a similar type of hormone at the same time that pancreas is, is squirting out insulin. And IGF-1, for years, has been known as a cancer growth factor. So now you have the sugar floating, giving the fuel, and then you have these other two switches that basically serve as the drivers for cancer growth. Not good. When you're stressed, that also impacts your bowels, as w I think many of us know. Um, and what can happen there is your gut then can become what we call leaky. The junctions, the tight junctions between the gut cells basically are not tight anymore. They start to loosen up a bit. And what, what that can do is that can lead to things getting into your blood that shouldn't. Okay, these things would normally pass through, but in this case, they don't. And so, for example, organisms like parasites and bacteria can enter the blood system. Also, proteins and food that shouldn't go across also can enter. And what happens? The body forms immune reactions against all of these things, and then you get systemic reactions across your body, doing things that have absolutely seemingly to you nothing to do with, with your gut. Okay, for example, fatigue, you know, that's an interesting one. Or weight gain, or anxiety, or other feelings um, problems with your skin, for example. A lot of things can happen, as I look to my dermatologist friend over here. Um, you know, basically, uh, this is an issue that we have to identify what sources of things that might cause leaky gut, and stress is one of them. Epigenetics is a huge field of science right now where stress itself can impact how your DNA is expressed by causing little changes that can occur on your DNA called methylation. Methylation are little chemical changes that, that occur that allow the DNA to either be or not be processed properly, and that can turn on or turn off a variety of genes in your body, particularly cancer-promoting genes would not be good. And almost universally, when you're chronically stressed, it turns on cancer-promoting genes. In addition, when you're chronically stressed, it causes pain to be more perceived. So these hormones actually increase the pain intensity. And the, these hormones can be measured, okay? In the morning, when you wake up in the morning, cortisol levels are very low. And as you go throughout the day, the cortisol levels go up. And as you approach nighttime, they go down. And then melatonin actually goes exactly the opposite direction. And you can measure this in your saliva. And I do this in, uh, as a kit that I give patients in the office to see how normal you are and see if you're secreting properly, if you're over-secreting or under-secreting. And uh, what we can find out is sort of what stage of what we call adrenal fatigue or exhaustion you may be in. Um, there are a variety of things that we can do to reduce stress. This is probably actually one of the most important ones, is actually exercise. Getting enough sleep is really super important, not just for the fact that it also reduces the cortisol, but of course it has very big impacts on the regulation of melatonin, which is an anti-cancer hormone. And we've gone through meditation and how it changes the brain in a very short period of time. And there are some, some fun ways that you can do this. I use, a, I use binaural beat technology, which is just a, a fun way of, basically I, listen, I have uh, headphones that I put on and you press play on, on your little player and, and you will actually be able to get yourself into a meditative state by synchronizing the brain waves. Um, within about 15 minutes, you can get yourself into a theta brainwave state, which we were just briefly alluded to in the prior talk. Uh, here is that same uh, thing, and I, this, I have this. I think it's cool. It's a, just a biofeedback device. There's a variety of other things, guided imagery, which is also sort of like hypnosis. Yoga incorporates a variety of different techniques of exercise, breathing, and meditation. Um, of course, this is one of my patients getting a little bit of acupuncture. Aromatherapy works great. Uh, my last name, Lewenda, means lavender in Polish, so it actually is 
cool. And then if there's, the conven there's the conventional therapies, so cognitive behavior therapy, for example, the talk therapies, and then drugs. There's a variety of natural supplements that uh, have been shown to work in some smaller studies. And this is uh, he you know, here now and uh, here to be here big uh, in Vegas shortly. All right, and I do want to do this. Do I have time to do basically a four-minute little thing or no? All right, I run out of time. Okay, we'll do one minute. Yes. So this is a technique called 478 breath technique. So I'd just like to just put your hands down in your lap and relax for a second here. And this is, there are a bit four slides and that's it. All right, and it, they will count for you. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to breathe through your nose in deeply for four seconds. You're going to hold your breath for seven seconds. So you need a good deep breath. And then you're going to breathe out slowly through your mouth for eight seconds. Okay, so this will have some bubbles to help you count. I'm not going to count for you. Okay, so here we go. Whoa, this was, uh, this, we can't do this because it's not gonna, it's not gonna do it. So, all right, I will tell you. Okay, breathe in. Hold your breath. Blow slowly through your mouth. Breathe in. Hold. Blow out. Breathe in. Hold. Blow out. And last one. Breathe in. Blow out. Thank you.